I had a very interesting call with Eric and uh, we are going to talk about if you really need to use power layers and power planes in your PCB stackup. Eric will be using four layer stackup as an example, but everything what we are going to talk about will also apply on stackups with any number of layers. Okay, let's start. Here is my recorded call with Eric. So in, in the PCB class I teach, I always start out with my students and I ask them, you know, we, we build traces that are six mils wide with one ounce copper. That's the narrowest that all fab houses can always do. And, and I asked my students, when you look at that trace on the board, it is about the size, it's got the cross section of a human hair. And I asked them, you take a human hair, how much current do you think you can put through a human hair before it's going to get warm to the touch, before you have to start worrying about the, the power consumption in it because of the current and its resistance? And you, you probably know the answer to this, but a lot of my students that come in, that they look at that tiny human hair, that tiny trace on the board, and they think, oh my gosh, maybe 10 milliamps, maybe maybe 100, can't imagine 100 milliamps going through that tiny little piece of copper. And when you look at you know the IPC spec, what is it, 2221 or the, the one, 2254, the one that talks about maximum current through a trace, you look at the, the spec, you look at some of the online calculators that are out there to estimate it, and when you build a board and you do the measurement, what you find surprisingly is that six mil wide trace, you can put an amp through it before it gets even noticeably warm. And you can put, typically it's three to three and a half amps before it gets in a thermal runaway and then gets so hot that it, that it fuses open. Mm -hmm. So the IPC spec says, you know, about an amp for, half, for one ounce copper, um, uh, six mil wide, wide trace. That is a huge amount of current. That's six mil wide. And if you make it 20 mils wide, you can put three amps through it without any issues. And so when you realize how much current how, or how, how narrow a trace you can still use and get reasonable currents, you realize that for power distribution, unless you're dealing with hundreds of amps, which you know there are a lot of processor designs that use hundreds of amps. There's network processors out there that are running a thousand amps of current just for one chip. So when you get into the really high currents and the hundred amp and above, you got to worry about really wide traces, two ounce copper planes to carry all of that DC current. But when you're dealing with, you know, 10 amps uh, for dis distributing over the board, you don't need a plane to distribute 10 amps. A wide, a sufficiently wide trace, three amps is um, 20 mils wide, 10 amps, 100 mils wide, will be able to carry that current easily for DC current, minimum voltage drop and and no temperature rise so with that perspective thinking about okay that's what it takes to make you know basically reduce that source of a problem if you're doing a 10 amps or below 100 mil wide traces to distribute power you don't need planes for power and so now it gets to the question of okay given that idea that you don't need a plane to distribute power what are the other problems that you're trying to fix in selecting the stack of design and you want to pay attention to the noise and having a return plane like this design here for each of the signals will dramatically reduce ground bounce you can say well why not use this plane or this stack well you know one of the problems is it's asymmetric um and uh and and that may you know depending on the uh, the material used and the thicknesses it might contribute to a little warpage in the board uh, because of the asymmetry in it um the other what problem does it is, mean is it going to bend or yeah. So, you know, when you build the stack up and if the, if this is the, this layer here is the solid ground, a lot of copper there, copper has a higher thermal, uh, uh, coefficient of, of expansion than, um, uh, than the epoxy. And so when you laminate all the layers together at temperature, uh, when it, when everything is laminated and cured at temperature, it's in its neutral place. There's no stress. When you cool it down, the copper contracts more than the epoxy and that puts if it's asymmetric that puts stress on it and it bends up like a little potato chip mm -hmm. um and yeah. so but you know if it's a thick board you may not see that effect but if it's a large board uh you you might i've seen this uh, couple of times and sometimes just pcb itself may be fine but once you run it through uh, all on when you are assembling components then yeah it can get right. like really bad 
And and so that's the general guideline that says not for electrical but for mechanical reasons reasons you want to use a symmetrical stack up mm -hmm. with you know co comparable uh copper um distributions on the on the layers mm -hmm. and it's not just just islands of copper it's the same i don't know c connection of the copper so that the stresses are the same if you have islands of copper that's great for y getting uniform current density when you're plating but it doesn't do anything for the thermal stress because they're not connected um, so there's all these other mechanical issues to worry about for the copper distribution but in general it, you know a lower risk path is using a symmetrical stack up so you know be careful about using the stack up and if you do in the routing of the two signal layers on one side if you don't have them orthogonal completely orthogonal you'll have excess the broadside coupling you'll have excess crosswalk so this is possible but it's a dangerous stack up mm -hmm. and so, so you want to get a uh, the note there, it means uh, on one layer, maybe you would like to mostly route one direction and on the other layer, maybe the different direction. Exactly, orthogonal, yeah. so that they don't, if they're on top of each other on different mm -hmm. layers, you'll get an enhanced crosstalk mm -hmm. and that will be pathological, that will cause problems. This is, again. sometimes I, I actually tell people that uh, they should be careful about this uh, um, running tracks in parallel on different layers because the space between them can be even smaller than if they are routing them on same layer. Yeah, in dual strip line where you have two layers, you have to be really careful of routing the interconnects on one layer orthogonal to the other layer because you're absolutely right. You, If they are ever co-parallel, like in a BJ escape region, even for a short distance, you can have enhanced crosstalk and if the rise times are short enough, um, that crosstalk can easily exceed a 15% uh, noise budget. Mm -hmm. And is it because so, uh, they are also there is also wider um, space which is uh -huh. routed in parallel and also they are closer because thickness of the layers? Yeah, it's, it's not just the signal, it's also when they're, when they're co-parallel, mm -hmm. they couple to each other, plus their returns couple as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so oh, it's, yeah. the, it's the capacitive coupling and the mutual inductance coupling because the returns are overlapping a little bit too. Okay. So all that contributes to more crosstalk. Okay. We we call that topology, we call that broadside coupled, and you want to avoid broadside coupling. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you do have adjacent signal layers, it's okay, just route them orthogonal and mm -hmm. be, be sure that they're routed orthogonal in the layers. So that this is this is a possible stack up. It's just a little dangerous, a little higher risk. Watch out for that. You need to know um, what you are doing. You need to know, pay attention to it, right? Mm -hmm. You need to understand those signals. And so here's some other stack ups that are a little bit uh, better that have two return planes, mm -hmm. uh, reference planes. This one here, I surprisingly, I get a lot of folks say, I want to use this because I've got a strip line layer here and that'll be lower noise. And I contend that you can have just as low a noise or comparable low noise in some of these other structures as in this structure. Uh, and this is a little asymmetrical. And so again, you want to watch out for the, the asymmetry. I think, um, I so, think the, the biggest uh, question mark in this case would be the core or the space between uh, layer two and layer three will be usually much, much, much big. bigger comparing to yeah. layer one and layer. So it may not even yeah. kind of influence, it, it may not be even based. Well, it you're right, it will be a bigger space so that there be more coupling between this signal layer and mm -hmm. the plane over here. Um, but it's still a strip line environment and okay. there's still a thinking, you know, and again, you have to put in the numbers to see that there's a thinking that, oh, this is strip line, there's less EMI, there's less um, uh, uh, less crosstalk in this configuration. And, and I would contend that, it, you, know, you know, it's a different topic, but we will touch on a little bit that, you know, there's a lot of folks that, that come to me and say, well, I don't like using microstrip because they radiate and they give EMI problems. Mm -hmm. And and in 2019, IPC published the numbers of 30 billion with a B square feet of circuit boards were manufactured in 2019. 30 billion square feet. Every single one of those square feet had microstrip traces and they all passed a uh, uh, an EMC or FCC type certification test. So it is possible to engineer microstrip traces that don't radiate. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you that um, it's not so much the microstrip traces that radiate, it's the return paths that radiate. Mm -hmm. So I don't think using this 
stack up or this stack up in order to use strip line to prevent uh, EMI. Shielding. I don't think that's yeah. necessarily yeah. shielding, right? I don't think that's necessarily a good argument because I can screw up any of these configurations just as easily as I can with microstrips. Mm -hmm. And I can make microstrip perform better than these if you engineer it well. Mm -hmm. um, so so then it comes to, okay, what's the what's a better stack up? And it usually comes down for a four layer board, these two configurations, mm -hmm. um, microstrip um, uh, planes on the inner. And so the question is, well, what do you want the planes to be? Do you want power and ground? And I think there's a very common sense of, let's use power and ground planes because there's a lot of talk about, oh, the power and ground planes have embedded capacitance, mm -hmm. that they have distributed capacitance, high frequency capacitance, and that's good for decoding. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm gonna use power and ground planes in my board because I have more area that way. And I don't think that's necessarily a valid discussion because it's not the capacitance in the power and ground planes that's important. It's tiny compared to the, the discrete components you add. What's important is low inductance from the IC pads to the decoupling capacitor. Mm -hmm. And if you place them close together, you don't need planes to do that. You just need wide connections to do that. And that mm -hmm. can be done on signal layers as well. So I'm gonna show you an example of between these two layers, if you, or I'm sorry, between these two stack ups, microstrip on the outside and two planes on the inside, which is better? And I'm gonna show you where, uh, uh, I'm gonna show you a source of noise problem that you can minimize if you use this stack up. The two important features that these two stack ups have in common is the fact that they have planes in the inner layers. And that means that every signal layer is adjacent to a plane. And that's really good because that means you got a continuous return path. This, the signals on this layer would use this plane for their return. The signals on this layer would use this plane as their return. And that's really good because that means we'll reduce ground bounds. So they've got two planes, or they got a plane adjacent to the signal, that's great. The other is that the return currents of this signal layer are on this plane. They're not on this plane. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the return currents of this signal are on this plane, they're not on this plane. The return currents of this signal are on this plane, they're not on this plane. And so each plane has the return currents of the signals adjacent to them only. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the starting place. If in the stack ups, the um, signals never changed layer. In other words, you always routed the signals on this layer. There were no vias connecting signals on this layer to the bottom layer. Then it probably doesn't matter which of these two you use. There won't be any much difference in performance. But when you introduce vias, signal vias, between signals on the top layer, switching to the bottom layer, you have to pay as much attention to the return paths as the signal paths. And that's where the noise is introduced. Okay, I have and, another question. Yeah, go for it. Can the power plane be any voltage? Yes. In fact, I'm gonna show you, so if you're gonna use a power plane, it can be any voltage you want. In fact, if it's split, that is, if you have three different voltages, you have to be really careful because now you don't have a continuous plane anymore and you run the potential risk of crosstalk. C combination of ground bounce because it's discontinuing the return path. And I'm gonna show you how, even if they're the same voltage, even if you have a split plane but the same voltage and you have another split plane here, with the same voltage and you think I'm gonna add some shorting vias, stitching vias between them. So I have ultimately this convoluted path, but it's continuous. That will still contribute to significant noise. Okay, but so, can can the voltage be even if it's not like directly related to the voltage of the signals which you are running on, on the layer four? Like yep. usually- So these are 3.3 volt signals. Because, because what I, I heard was like, you can use well, good. Uh, you can use power plane as a good uh, reference plane when uh, it is the same voltage as is the signal which is running close to the plane. So if you have like, let's say example, what you are saying is if you have, uh, for example, twelve volts coming to your board, and then you have a couple of. Uh, regulators, uh, I don't know, changing to 5 volts and then 3 volts, and then you are running 
these 3.3 volt signals on the layer 4, you still can use the 12 volt power plane as a good reference plane. Oh, now you're adding a qualifier of good in there. So that's a different question. So I'll tell you that the voltage, the DC voltage of the return plane adjacent to the signal is not what is important. Mm -hmm. It can be any DC voltage you want. Two things are important. One is that you don't have a gap in the return plane so that you don't have, here's a 12 volt region, here's a five volt region, and the signal's gonna cross over it because that's a discontinuity in the return path. That's problem number one. Problem number two is, maybe I used this metaphor with you once before. When you have two, you know, this stack up here, when you have two different voltage planes mm -hmm. and you have signals that are gonna transition, if, if the signal only uses that plane as its return, it's a who cares. It's when the signal transitions its return. When it starts on one layer and goes through the other layer, so the return current has to change layers, that's when the problem is created. It's the, the metaphor I like to use is, it's like when you jump off a building, the falling part, that's not the problem. When you're, when you're falling, you watch all the people in the, in, in the rooms that you pass by, you wave to them, you're having a wonderful time. When you're, when you're falling, you're having a great time, it's not a problem. It's when you land, that's the problem. And so when you have a, a different voltage and the signal's traveling down that signal line and it's got a 12 volt or a 15 volt uh, plane adjacent to it, that signal return is perfectly fine. Signal return, signal return, signal return, no problem at all. It's when the signal has to transition, when it lands and transitions between one layer and the next, that return current on that 12 volt plane has to make it to the zero volt plane. And how does that return current flow? You can't, the, the lowest impedance, it's all about impedance in that path because it's the current through the impedance that gives you a voltage and that voltage is noise. And so it's all a question of how do you reduce the impedance that return current sees in transitioning from one plane to the other plane? Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the lowest impedance interconnect structure you can make? If you wanted Same to make voltage, a low impedance- I don't know. Well, if they're, it, regardless of what the voltages are, the lowest impedance connection between these two planes is a via. That is going to oh, always okay. be yeah, the lowest sorry. impedance path. But if they're different voltages, the technical term for that situation is you're screwed. You can't put a via between oh, them because yeah, they're oh, different I know, voltages. I understand now what you mean. So when you connect them with a via, which will connect both planes, that's the lowest impedance, but uh, that's exactly right. what I meant when they are same yeah. voltage. So they have can, to be, yeah. they have to be the same voltage mm -hmm. to add a via. Then you can create so the lowest connection between the them. lowest, lowest impedance. impedance. Yeah. Right, right. And the lowest impedance means when that return current flows from one plane to the next, it flows through a low impedance, you get a small voltage between it. And that means, hey, l less mm -hmm. noise between those paths. And it's that noise in the return path that's shared by all the other signals passing through those layers. And the more currents that flow, the more DIDT, the more noise that you, you get. And so that is the secret to thinking about the noise source when you have two different voltage planes. So how this that transition will happen if they are different voltages? Well, that's the challenge. Let me show you the next picture here. So here is the illustration of those currents that mm -hmm. have to flow. Uh, and so here are those two planes. So here's a four layer board. You get the signal on the top layer, the microstrip signal on the bottom layer. The, you get the adjacent plane to him, the adjacent plane to him. When the signal's on the top, it's going signal return, signal return. So the return current's on the top layer, top plane. When the signal's on the bottom layer, it's signal return, signal return, signal return. And so when that signal hits the return via and has to make its way down here, the signal is going through this via. How does the return current, signal return, signal return, the return current sees this cavity, this gap, and there's always some impedance between them. Two pieces of metal, they have an impedance. The closer they are, the lower the impedance. Mm -hmm. And so that return current is going to flow between them. And when you have two conductors separated by some distance and you have current flowing between that impedance, we have just built a transmission line. Mm -hmm. These two planes, regardless of what their voltage is, I don't care what the DC voltages on these guys are, regardless of what they are, they are two planes. They make up a cavity. That cavity has an impedance. The wider it is, 
the lower the impedance. Mm -hmm. The closer they are, the lower the impedance. Mm -hmm. And it's the impedance, that cavity, that this return current flows through and generates a voltage. If it's one ohm and it's a one milliamp of return current, it's a millivolt of voltage that propagates between these two planes passing along. And if you have, you know, an amp and, and you have a, a millivolt, well, let's see, it's an amp and, a, and, a, and an ohm, then you have a volt of, 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 no, of voltage between the, these two planes that's propagating down here. Anything else that passes through this cavity sees a voltage noise between these planes. How, so how the large will be this? That current is going to spread out in that cavity mm -hmm. and it's going to propagate in, in the, we call the cavity the two planes. Mm -hmm. that, that, that current, that return current is going to keep propagating in that oh, cavity all always. the way out, always, until mm -hmm. it hits the ends. And if it's open at the ends, it's going to reflect and come back. And we're going to hit what we call the resonances of the cavity. And this can be very long range. It's not just noise adjacent to the next signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's noise adjacent, it also, but it can be very because long. Because it's transition range. It's line, transmitting it everywhere. Travels, through. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I understand. Exactly. And so this is an insidious problem. This is, it, it's going to spread. And this is just one signal. If you have 10 or 20 signals transitioning with a bus, they're all going to introduce their current into the cavity, and it's going to give you even more DIDT noise. And so the the lowest noise is going to be when I have the lowest impedance between these two planes. And that means the number one way of reducing the impedance, adding a return mm -hmm. via. But I can't add a return via if they're different voltages. Mm -hmm. If they're diff And if they're the same voltage, then I want to add a return via. And that's the motivation for why you want to use these planes as the same. Mm -hmm. And the preference, if they're going to be multiple planes in the same voltage, make them ground. That way you have the opportunity of adding a return via. And then you can say, well, what if they're not? What if I have power and ground planes? What if this is five volts and this is ground? And then I would ask, why are you making this five volts? Why don't you make it ground? What is that strong, compelling reason to make this five volts? If you think you need interplane capacitance, rethink that, that, that rationale. That is not a strong motivation to use a plane. The only reason to have a plane is if you've got tens of amps that you need to distribute. That that gives you the low resistance in, in that path if you have a lot of current that you want to distribute. If you're talking about you know microcontroller kind of products, digital systems, you know 10 amps or less of current, you don't need a plane to distribute that power through your system. If then in that environment, use the two planes as ground and use traces 10 mil or 20 mil for three amps, 100 mils for 100 amps, um, tr uh, power traces on, on your uh, existing with your, your signal layers. And then make these two ground planes so that you can add a return via. Then I also, if, sorry. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I will, okay, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, if you have that you know strong, compelling reason to make this a voltage plane, you'll have exactly the same problem. You're gonna have voltage, you're gonna have return current that has to make its path between the two planes. How does it do that? It does it through the impedance of the cavity. And how do you reduce that impedance? The number one most important way, if there are different voltages and you can't add a return via, the most important thing you can do is make this separation as thin as you can. Mm -hmm. That's why you wanna use really thin dielectric between power and ground planes. First, I would ask, rethink why you want a power plane. But if you really do have a strong, compelling reason for a power plane, always try to make the power plane adjacent to ground plane with a really thin dielectric. Okay. And I've seen many designs with power planes that sandwich them between two ground planes. So you have three planes coincident with, or, or, or adjacent to each other with the power, and it could be a split power in the middle. If that's the case and you have two grounds on either side, there's no return current on that split power plane. Not a problem at all because all the outside planes are ground and they're the ones that are using that that have the return currents and you can have return vias between those planes i have so two that's yeah go two for questions it. which i would like to confirm because i read this on the internet many times and i say this also a couple of times so what you are saying there is no really relationship between the voltage on the signal and the power plane. It, 
the voltage of the power plane doesn't really matter. It's not going to be better if the power plane is the same voltage as the signal is. Correct? Absolutely right. Yes. Okay. DC okay. volt number one is don't use a power plane, but if you're going to use a power plane as a return, its DC voltage has zero impact on the signal that propagates using it as a return. Only what is important is make use the power plane which can be as solid as possible. Continuous, okay. right? The, right. Okay, the second thing what I would like to confirm then and what I read many times and I also say this. <laughs> so uh, decoupling capacitors are not going to help with this. So that's the second uh, um, d design principle. So if you've accepted the fact that you have a strong compelling reason to use a power plane, the first way of re is all about reducing the impedance between the two planes, the ground and the power plane that are adjacent, when the return currents have to switch. That's the that's the design principle, design guideline to use. Number one way of reducing that impedance, add a return via. That means make them the same. If you're not going to make them the same, then the number one way, or the number two way of reducing the impedance is bring them close together. And then you get them as close together as you can engineer. And now comes the third way of reducing their impedance, and that's adding a capacitor between them. And I hesitate to say it's a decoupling capacitor. It is really a via between the two planes, because that's the lowest impedance, with a DC block. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about the capacitance. That's not providing the low impedance. It's the via between them that's providing the low impedance, but you can't connect a via between them because they're different voltages, you have to put a DC block between them. And so you want enough capacitance so that it provides a low enough impedance at, at the lower frequency, but the most important criteria is you want low inductance in the via. But you know, you have to, if you get two, two planes, you have to put a via on or capacitor on the top layer. So you're guaranteed to have one via going up to the capacitor going across the via, another via going down. So you've got like three or four times the length when you add a capacitor than if you had a single via. Mm -hmm. So a, a decoupling capacitor or a DC blocking capacitor is a poor man's way of adding a, a via between the two planes. Okay. It is a poor substitute to making them the same voltage and adding a via between them. But they are going to work only for specific frequencies no because well it's all about the inductance of that path and whether it's um uh, uh the via going up to the capacitor and back down again or it's a single via you will always have you know it's like three four five times that you know here i say the dc blocking capacitor makes a poor shorting via you know two to ten times higher inductance than the single via itself a single via is going to look inductive a, a decoupling capacitor is going to look inductive or DC block capacitor is going to look inductive above, you know, 10 megahertz. That's what I meant. Yeah. A number. yeah, but they're both inductive. It's impedance that's important. Doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you know, reactance on it. It's impedance that's important. They're both going to look inductive. The single via is going to have a lot lower impedance than the inductance of the via going up to the capacitor, across the capacitor, and back down again. Okay. It's, you know, two to, two to 10 times higher inductance in that path two to 10 times higher impedance in that path. And that guarantees you're going to have more switching noise when you have a capacitor there. Again, it's a via shorting the two planes with the DC block. Okay. It's the only way you can do it if they're different voltages. Okay. That's I how understand. to think about it. So capacitor is, a, is it, also fine. It's not the best, but it's it, not the it best, may right. help a little bit. It is a poor substitute for doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. And it, But you know what? It may be good enough in your design. Uh, and so the first, the first decision, it's a decision tree that you're making. You want to use the same plane so you can add a shorting via. If you're not going to use the same planes, same voltage planes, make sure you have a strong, compelling reason why not. If you can't answer that question, the reason I'm using a power plane is this. If you can't answer that with a good answer, and, and you don't have a good way, reason for not using ground plane, make it a ground plane. That will mm -hmm. always reduce the noise. If you have if you have that strong, compelling reason, you're going to make it a power plane because you get, you know, 100 amps you're distributing through your system. You need that power plane. Then thin dielectric and low inductance DC block 
between the um, the two planes. I would like to ask, do you think uh, larger PCBs are more um, like, do you need to think much more about all these effects when you are designing larger PCBs comparing to smaller ones? So you always, whenever you make a cavity, whenever you make two planes, whatever their voltage is, you always want to be thinking about uh, the resonances in the cavity. You know, we've talked a lot about signals and signal propagation and discontinuities and reflections topologies. That is one common interconnect structure that you have in your board. Another interconnect structure that you have when you have multiple planes is when they're adjacent layers is the cavity they make up. And a cavity has its own set of properties to have to watch out for. And we can spend another session on talking about cavities. I had a one of my um, PhD students who's now at um, AMD. He did his thesis on the problem cavities introduce because of signals going through them. That they that is this very effect. It's the return currents going through the cavity. They can excite the resonances, and so the length of the, the physical dimensions of the cavity influence those resonant frequencies, and you always want to be aware of, given the size of your board, where those resonances are. If you have split planes, you'll have funny shaped cavities in packages, you'll have funny shaped cavities, and you want to always be thinking about where are the resonant frequencies of the cavities, and where, what are the frequencies of your signal? And if the signals ever pass through the cavities and introduce their return currents into the cavities, if the frequency components of the return currents are comparable to the resonance of the cavity, you can see excessive noise. Mm -hmm. And just as a you know rule of thumb, if you take a package that's like you know inch on a side, you know like like 25 millimeters on a side, something like that, 25, 35 millimeters on a side, or a, a region of the board that's on that size. The resonant frequency for that is about two and a half gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what Bluetooth is and, and Wi-Fi, two and a half gigahertz Wi-Fi. And so if you have cavities that are on the order of that size and you have Bluetooth signals come into a receiver, you know, low level signals in a receiver and a transmitter nearby, you have the potential of enhanced crosstalk because of resonances in those cavities. Mm -hmm whole nother topic to worry about. So yeah, you have to worry about the size and shape of the cavities. And that's another compelling reason why you want all the planes on adjacent layers to be the same voltage so you can suppress the resonances by adding return vias between them. Mm -hmm. Because I always thought larger boards are more critical because also, you know, you, you need to in smaller boards, there will be always many decoupling capacitors and and ground vias in very small space. So you don't need to even like intentionally do it. It just will be there because there is no other way how to route this small board. But if you are designing yeah. large boards, yeah. you have to do it intentionally. This kind of tweaking. Yeah, that's right. You have to think about it. It's not, you know, you know, whatever you think about design guidelines. There are general principles to pay attention and follow, um, uh, but you also want to, you know, put in the numbers that uh, to, to see, well, how much of a problem are you going to have? And yeah, if you have a large board, if you have return vias to, f to provide the return path for signals, you may have regions of the board where you don't have a lot of signals, so you don't have a lot of return vias. You just have to think about, is that going to be a potential problem? Mm -hmm. What are the bandwidths of the signals, what are the resonances of the shapes? And adding return vias between the two planes controls the boundary conditions. They change, mm -hmm. they, they make islands of that, that can resonate because of, of the distance between them. So that's planes. why you put stitching vias also in empty exactly. places. Yeah. So you don't have very large uh, cavity right. which can resonate on lower frequencies. At the lower for frequencies, example. exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, the rule of thumb is, and I think in the uh, power integrity book that uh, Larry Smith and I wrote. We have a chapter about that resonances and cavities, and we show an example of the rule of thumb. If you have two, if you have a board 
that has two planes. Doesn't matter their DC voltage, they can both be ground planes. It's just that they're two pieces of metal adjacent. They will resonate at some frequency based on the length between the the edges. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, it's the boundary condition. And and you, if you don't want those resonances, which means it couples more energy at certain frequencies, you want to make sure that you push the lowest resonant frequency, you want to push that to a frequency above the bandwidth of your signals. Mm -hmm. So your signals don't have any energy to excite that cavity and to get enhanced mm -hmm. noise. And so you calculate, you know, given the rise from your signals, what the bandwidth is. And then the rule of thumb is you take that bandwidth, that frequency, and in that, um, uh, in, in that cavity, you want to make sure that you have, in whatever that highest frequency is, calculate what the wavelength is, you want to have at least six vias in every wavelength. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if your frequency is bandwidth is a gigahertz, uh, in FR4, the wavelength is six inches. That's the wavelength. And so you want to have at least six vias in one wavelength. So that's every, every inch. inch. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you lay out your board, you put all the signals and you route them all. If you have regions where uh, you have vias that are farther up return vias farther apart than an inch you might want to throw in i think altium has the feature of adding you know return vias on a grid um, and you want to make sure you have at least every inch a return mm -hmm. via and that will suppress the resonances in that cavity down to the bandwidth of your signals mm -hmm. okay that's different different topic other but examples it's interesting. Of that. Uh, yeah. and uh, okay yeah let's continue in yeah this one. so so here's this question so 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 it, I, i've given you a kind of idea of why you want the two planes to be the same voltage and what the potential problem can be if there are different voltage because of the return current and the noise in the return current. i have an example of a board that we use in my pcb class to illustrate this and and so here's here's the the board that we've built actually well here's here's the board with two layers so we built a this is a four layer board and um and and here's the stack up we got signals on the top and bottom some microstrips and we have two planes in the middle and uh here is the the one of the boards and here's the top view here's the bottom view mm -hmm. and on the top view i've got a little clock oscillator mm -hmm. chip here um and on the bottom i have two hex inverters mm -hmm. so they're all going to drive their outputs, you know, they're all going to be driven by the clock. They're all going to switch simultaneously. So you have 12 IOs, they're going to switch. And so you can see the routing for the signals. They go over here on the top layer microstrip to an array of signal vias. They go to the top layer and they come over here on the top layer. And I have some LEDs and resistors just so I have some current. And mm -hmm. the LEDs tell me, yep, they're all on. So that's going to be the circuit. The signals go from the bottom layer to the top layer, and then they get terminated to the ground plane on this this layer on, on layer two in the in the stack up. And I have this other signal line you can see over here mm -hmm. that's shorted to the ground player, layer two, short of the ground player. It goes through a signal via to the bottom of the board and now it gets picked off over here and then it comes over here to a test point. Mm -hmm. So it is literally just a, a signal line going from the bottom layer through a via to the top layer, shorted to ground. It is a loop. It's a pickup coil, pickup loop. It's going to be my victim line. So it's and I'm basically measure... a wire which is connected to your ground plane in specific point, and it, you are yeah, you are. Uh... It is literally doing this. It's it's just going to go through the board and then connect it over here to the bottom plane. Mm -hmm. And so any noise that's in here is going to be picked up. I'm going to see it as. There, here's the signal. It's going to go this way. It's going to have this return current as part of it, and it's going to see this noise as part of the signal over here. Okay. On one so side, on the left the... side, you are going to put the probe and measure it, yep. and on the yep. right side, it's connected to ground. It's a shorter to ground, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's going to have this cavity noise as part of its path that I'm going to measure. So in so ideal my... world, there should be just ground. There should be no noise. Right. It's connected to ground. Yeah. Then and nobody else is. I'm going to see just zero, yeah. right? But it's this voltage here, the ground bounce noise or the the ground impedance noise between the cavity that I'm going to see as part okay. of its noise when the other IOs switch, when their DIDT goes through. So that's the structure of these two boards. And then here are the two different stack ups. So one of them, I have a return via shorting the two planes adjacent to every signal that switches. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the only place that I have the return VS. I have so question. So we got two planes. I have yeah. question. So in the stack up, you say one is ground and the second one is power. And you say you have so, two Right. So so really what I mean is this is a floating plane. Okay. Because I'm not distributing so it's not connected on it. Anywhere. Anywhere. Nowhere. Okay. Except in this board, but it's used as a return path, right? The signals on the bottom layer use it as a return path. And when they transition from the signal layer on the bottom to the signal layer on the top, their return currents transition to the, the top plane. They re, the transition to the top plane. When in, in this board, so I built two identical boards with exactly the same stack up. The only difference is in this board, I added shorting vias between the two mm -hmm. planes to provide that low impedance path for the return current. In this board, I did not add any return mm -hmm. vias. I actually added pads for a capacitor if I wanted to put a capacitor from the bottom plane to the top plane, mm -hmm. but you can see I didn't add anything mm -hmm. here. So those two planes are isolated. And now we can measure the noise impact. So we're Before at this we one move first. to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so this is also proof that it does not really matter what kind of voltage is the power plane. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's floating. You yeah. make it any voltage you want. And it still yeah. helps. And uh, If you well, use the stitching vias. Ah, uh, yes, right, okay. right, right. Yeah, right. So, so oh, what but, we're going to do, we're going to oh, take... Okay, okay. Yeah? okay. But if you use yeah. the stitching vias, then it's ground plane. Yeah, got to make them the same voltage. Otherwise, you're screwed for another reason. Okay, so it's ground yeah. plane. Okay. <laughs> yeah, has to be ground plane. Here... It's floating. Make it any okay. voltage you want. DC voltage, I don't care. Because there's no connection to it. So let's take a look at this one first. So what we're going to do is we're going to send our 12 IOs from the bottom to the top. And we're going to, and these LEDs are going to turn on. And we're going to measure the noise on that poor victim line when they, when it switches. Okay. So here, here it is. And, and, um, you know, again, I apologize. I, I can't bring in my lab. I don't, I'm not in my lab right now. I can't show them the actual physical measurement of the set, but basically this is what we did. We powered it on. We got the IO that switched. I'm measuring the voltage across this resistor over here. Mm -hmm. And here in yellow is that voltage across the resistor. Mm -hmm. So this is the current. Here's the DIDT over here when it's switching. And I got 12 of them. So I got 12 times that DIDT. I use a fast edge, about a nanosecond or so. I get about 30 uh, milliamps switching. So I got 12 of them. That's the 360 milliamps of current switching in a nanosecond. So, you know, 360 milliamps per nanosecond is the DIDT. All of that current's going through that plane. A nanosecond is six inches long. This board is only like, you know, two and a half inches long. So that edge is macroscopically large, electrically, uh, it's large compared to the, the board. So the board is electrically small. So that current is flowing everywhere up and down through that plane. And while it's flowing everywhere, I'm going to measure the noise on this poor victim line over here. And here's what I get. And so here's when it switches. Here's the victim line. And let's see, what is the scale? This is, can you see that? It's 200 millivolts of division. So the voltage noise that victim line sees is 400 to, you know, about, you know, maybe 700 millivolts peak to peak. Mm -hmm. That's the noise picked up by it, when I have 360 milliamps per nanosecond switching in the board. That's 700 mil. It's a three volts, three and a half, three point three volt signal. Seven and a half or 700 millivolts peak to peak noise on this poor victim line. That's the crosstalk that you see, and that's and it doesn't matter where I would measure that victim line. I'd see it everywhere on this board. It's long range, just because the the board is electrically short compared to the Ryzen. Okay, that's the problem that we want to avoid, and the way we avoid that is we make the two planes the same voltage so that we have the opportunity of adding a stitching via, a shorting via between them. And here is the comparison. So now we're gonna also do the same thing to this board that has the stitching via. It's the only difference between the boards. Here's that DIDT. Here I included, I saved the waveform. Here's that waveform that we saw before with no return mm -hmm. vias. And here's the noise with return vias. They're on the same scale and you can see the dramatic reduction mm -hmm. in the crosstalk. Yeah, there's a little bit of crosstalk there. Hey, you know, I got, uh, you know, it's it's not zero ohms between them. There's a little bit of impedance between them. Dramatic reduction. That's why we want to use the two planes to be the same voltage. 
So we have the opportunity of adding the shorting via. So it doesn't is, mean, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. It doesn't mean that a four layer board with a power plane isn't gonna work. Depends on how many signals transition, depends on how large the board is, it depends on what the inductance of the decoupling or the DC blocking capacitors that you add. There are a lot of, it depends on, and it may work, but there will come a design where it doesn't work because, uh-oh, you didn't have enough decoupling capacitors or because the, uh, the, the cavity was, was extra thick or because you had a lot of IOs that were switching simultaneously. So it, it's really about how much risk you want to take. And if you don't simulate the environment carefully, and this is a, this behavior of the return current switching is a very complex simulation to engineer. You need a 3D full wave solver like, let's see, ANSYS has SI wave, um, um, Hyperlinks has their uh, SIPI tool, um, uh, Keysight has the ADS SI Pro. You need a pretty sophisticated tool that includes the electromagnetic effects of the cavity and the signals coupling in to be able to simulate these kinds of effects. So if you're not going to simulate, you can. You, 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 it's a question of how much risk do you want to take in your design. And if you did the simulation and you found, oh my gosh, I have too much noise, what would be your fix? Your fix would be using two planes that are both the same voltage and adding return vias. Why not do that initially to reduce the risk? And so I would say, if you're not going to simulate, use as many risk reduction strategies as you can to ensure success. And two planes, both ground with return vias where we have an adjacent signal via, always a good low risk path. So I have a question. If someone would like to measure noise on existing board, do they need to put there this kind of traces connected to grounds or are there some other ways how you can measure this noise right. on, on, on the planes? So um, it's really easy. So this is a form of crosstalk. Mm -hmm. It is the victim line is just like another signal line. It's a form of cross. So we're measuring the crosstalk on that on that victim line. The that means that in your board, all you have to do, you know, and, and we chose a victim line to measure because the signal on it was zero. That meant the only thing that we're going to see on it, it's not signal, it has to be noise. Mm -hmm. And so if you can identify on your board some of the signal lines that are pegged low or tied low so that normally there shouldn't be any voltage on them, then you'll only thing you'll see on them if you go in and probe it with, you know, a little 10x probe, little, little tiny probe tips, what you measure will be the noise. And that is a really important way of looking at sniffing out the noise in your system. You want to make sure that how you probe it doesn't introduce other noise as an artifact of probing. And, and we cover a lot of these techniques in some of the webinars that I've done with Teldon LaCroix. And um, I think there's an example of one of the webinars in the, um, that you're going to post in the, in the notes. Uh, and, uh, and there are a whole bunch of other webinars that that we've done on this topic of how do you do measurements of noise in your system without introducing artifacts so you're getting a true idea the simplest way is you measure the voltage on any quiet line any line that doesn't have a signal on it and that's going to be a measure of the noise in your system you just want to make sure you're exercising the ios aggressively enough to get the kind of a worst case measure mm -hmm. of the noise so if and you really, if, sorry, you, yeah. if you would, uh, for example, um, drive only eleven of these tracks, and then you put scope on the one which is not driven, you still yeah. would see exactly, exactly this. Exactly right. Or? Yes. Yes. Yep. Exactly right. Um, I I just used all twelve because I wanted to maximize the noise to, that we see. Now, of course. If you looked at one of the aggressors that's switching, you would see the noise superimposed on it as well. The challenge is it's hard to distinguish, hmm, what's signal distortion when the IO switches versus the coupled noise from other guys? That's the only reason to use a line that is pegged low. So there's no ambiguity about 
what is signal that's switching and what is the noise crosstalk from the other traces. Um, but you can use any signal line and look at the signal on it and that will be a measure of the noise. It's just you know sometimes hard to distinguish what's signal transition and what's noise. What about the scope and probe? What kind of scope you will need and, and can you use any probe uh, or is going to disturb you are going to measure something what is not really right. there or right you know those are always really important questions to ask and that's where the me best measurement practices are really important um the the quick answer is um using a high impedance probe and if you're dealing with you know nanosecond kind of edges then um or, or longer a 10x probe is perfectly fine as long as you use really low tip inductance and i show and that's that's what we designed these test points for. You can see the test point over here is designed to have a tip with a little ground spring tip. Mm -hmm. that, so you, that you can't in. really, really use the inductance. big, long wire. Oh, you, you can use that, but it's going to introduce potential artifacts. Okay. And you have to be very careful of those artifacts. So you may not be measuring what's real. You may be measuring a measurement artifact. And what um, about the and, speed of the scope? So there it gets to the bandwidth of the scope and rough rule of thumb is um, if you know the rise time of your signals you go one over the rise time so let's use a, a nanosecond edge if you're using a nanosecond rise time one over nanoseconds a gig gigahertz you want to try to use a scope with a bandwidth of at least one gigahertz mm -hmm. and that way it has enough bandwidth to see the signal and um and and the bandwidth of the scope doesn't influence the rise time that you see so, and again, a lot of these best measurement practices are covered in um, the webinars that I do with Tel and LaCroix, and they're all listed on the left side of the bethesignal.com website, and they're all free. Um, so if anybody has an interest in, in um, learning about some of the best measurement practices for um, uh, scopes, different rise time signals, uh, check out the, um, the left-hand side, the, the webinar is listed there on the bethesignal.com website. Okay, I wanted to mention this because I, on forum I've seen many times people uh, saying like, okay, this is what I measure on my signals and, and that's it. Yeah? And, and they don't say like what probe they use, what, what scope they use, and they just like, this is what I see, what is happening, tell me <laughs> how to fix it. Right, yeah. And I'm trying to remember now, I think um, in one of the webinars I did, I show, I know I've done this live, I used to do... Um, live demos at DesignCon, and I'd show examples of how the the type of probe that you use influences what the noise looks like. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it's purely a measurement artifact. It's not about what's going on on your board. Um, and, you know, it's one of the labs that I do with my students is one of the first labs is I show if you use, they're, they're used to using these big old long floppy interconnect wires, jumper wires to make connections. And I see some students before they have watched my videos or, or learned the right techniques, they'll have these big long floppy wires going under their circuit board from their scope probe. And all they're seeing is crosstalk between the probes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so when I show them the example of that, and then we switch to, the, they see an incredible difference in the signal quality and the crosstalk when they use the small tips mm -hmm. and the little spring loads and, and these, and that's why we use these test points to, because it dramatically reduces the probe to probe crosstalk. Okay, so you have so, more slides what we would like yeah. to talk about. Well, today. just one quick topic because yeah. I, I, I'm running out of time. So this is really about why in the stack if you want to use solid return planes, you want to have a, a multiple stack up, you want to have return a, a return plane adjacent to the signals and why you want those two planes, if you can, to be the same voltage because it enables you to add a return mm -hmm. via between them. That's why you want them the same voltage. And, and that reduces this type of switching noise. That's one of the problems. There's another, and, and so I hear from other folks, well, I'll just use, why do I need that plane? I'm just gonna use copper fill on all the signal layers, and I'm gonna make the copper fill ground, and I'm gonna use vias to connect them. And the kernel will find its own return path because they're all ground, right? And I have vias between them, so the kernel will find its way. And so there's another problem that's introduced, and it's about near field emissions. and um, uh, and so near field, I, I, I mean, this is a little too complicated, but near field emissions are all I can measure in my lab. Near field just means 
that I am a short distance away from the source compared to the wavelength. And at a gigahertz, the wavelength is a foot. So anything that is, you know, you know, inches away is near field at a gigahertz and below. At at 10 gigahertz, you know, near field is like an inch. So if I'm a you know a couple inches away, it's 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 far field. It's the radiation pattern. And and so you have to be a little careful interpreting near field because near field you see all of the radiation from your source. These all these we call them multiple moments. At far field, the farther away I go, look, these drop off like R to the fourth, R to the R to the squared. The farther away I go, these drop off to be insignificant, but mm -hmm. this is the term that's mm -hmm. left. And so when I'm in the far field, all I see is one of those terms. Mm -hmm. And that's what contributes to rated emissions and failing in an FCC or CISPR type test. So it's far field that's important. But I have to be really far away to do a far field measurement for gigahertz and below. And, and that's why we have anechoic chambers. But in my lab, it's a desktop kind of measurement. I'm really close. It's always near field. And so you have to be careful that near field, I'm sensitive to all of these moments. And if I'm seeing this term or this term, it's a who cares? I'm not going to see that on far field, so don't worry about it. But I can't know that when I do a near field measurement. So that's my caveat that I'm only looking at near field. It may not apply to far field, but absolutely guaranteed. If I see something at far field and I see a lot of emissions in far field, Guaranteed, I'm going to see that in the near field. Mm -hmm. the, the reverse is not true. Just because I see a problem in near field doesn't mean I'm going to see it in the far mm -hmm. field. So that's the caveat here. So here's the how we're going to we're going to use pickup coils, basically little coils, in order to measure the near field emissions, the magnetic field emissions. You can use little precision coils, or I just like using it. Here's where I use I turn the problem of that big loop in a 10x probe. I turn that problem into a feature. I'm going to use it as a pickup coil to measure the near field emissions from the board. And I find it a really handy way of getting a sense of, you can't see the magnetic fields coming off your board, but this is a way of probing and sniffing them out a little bit. And so that's what we're gonna use. And I'm gonna use as the example, I'm gonna take a, a two layer board uh, that is a, a microcontroller board. This is a 328, these are Arduino boards. Three, uh, at Mega 320 microcontroller, love these little microcontrollers. Uh, we use them in our class, and one of the labs that I do in my PCB class is we rebuild, we redesign this uh, 328 microcontroller board, use exactly the same circuit, only we use a layout done correctly. We use a layout that has a solid ground plane, and we do all the routing on one layer, and when we need to do a cross under, we do a cross under, but we keep them short. And so we have a continuous ground plane. And here, by contrast, and again, I know you don't do it in any of your lectures, but I see this in other guys out there. They will show, oh, you got your board, you put your components down, you route the components on the two layers, and after you've done all the routing, then you flood copper fill everywhere. And oh, yeah, you need to connect the copper pores with ground vias, so you add vias between them. And that's how they do, and that's how this was, the routing was done. No, uh, uh, not paying attention to the routing, the assumption is, hey, signals are just as good on the top layer as the bottom layer. I'm going to do all the routing, and then I'm going to add copper pour everywhere. And copper's good, and I'm going to make them all connect to the ground net. So that's what they've done here. And again, if interconnects were transparent, this would work just fine. But And, and even if interconnects are not transparent, this may work pretty well up to a point. There will always be more noise in this geometry than with a solid plane. And one of the biggest differences in the noise of this environment and this environment is in the near field radiation. Because when those signals switch from one piece of copper here to another piece of copper here, they have to take a convoluted path. They have to go up to some place through a via, down to some other place. They're taking all these loops. And whenever you have a bunch of loops, that means you have magnetic fields. When, when you have return current switching through them, you have magnetic fields. And so we're going to run exactly the same code through this board and through this board. And we're going to look at the near field emissions from the bottom of the board. And here is that example. So here is the commercial board. And here is, this is one of my students' boards. This is the techniques we teach them in my class. And here is the, again, same, you got the near field probes down here. Uh, and uh, you're looking at the 
uh, the near field pickup. This is this is near field pickup. There's no connection. We're just looking at the radiation nearby, and I I'm using one of the I/O switching as a here here you can see it connected on the board, and here it is connecting the board. We're using this as one of the signals switching to trigger the scope, so I know. When do I have all those IO switching? Mm -hmm. when, when do I have the DIDT? So here's that signal transitioning. And here is the pickup noise in this probe mm -hmm. for the commercial board. And here it is in red for, this is the class of the 57, there is the graduate level class I teach. Here's that board. And same thing, we move the probe around to find the maximum mm -hmm. amount of radiation. That's what I wanted to ask because I see the probes are in different. Yeah. And so I, I had to move them around in order to get the maximum, I did it for this one and I did it for this one. And this was literally the maximum field strength mm -hmm. that I could pick up. Uh, and so you can see dramatic, it's, this is more than an order of magnitude, it's like a factor of 20 reduction in near field emissions. Exactly the same circuit, exactly the same connections, uh, exactly the same code running. The only difference is how we implemented the layout. And that's why I always say never use copper pour. Yeah, it may work but you will always guaranteed have more emissions, near field emissions. Is that gonna break your product? Maybe not, but it's a way of, with no cost adder, it's a way of reducing the risk. Why not? And when you can have lower noise, means lower risk with no cost, it should be a habit. What's not to like about it? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the graphical demonstration of why you don't wanna use copper pour, you wanna use, um, good return path engineering. I, I don't actually, I don't normally do copper field because I have never, um, I I agree with what you did here. If you have like solid ground plane, I think it's not really necessary to put there copper pool because um, why? Exactly. <laughs> that is exactly the question to ask. What is the compelling, what is the problem you're trying to solve with the copper pour? that before you make an, a design, add a design feature, you always want to ask that question. What is the problem you're trying to fix? If you can't identify that problem and have a clear connection between here's the problem and here's how I'm going to fix it with this solution, sometimes it's the law of unintended consequences. It can add more problems than it fixes. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, definitely. This is a very nice example to see that one solid ground plane, even on two layer PCB, it means it's far away from signal layer. It still helps a lot. Right. Okay. So that's my, my core dump for today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric, for uh, all this time what you spent helping me with these videos and, you know, teaching all the people who are watching. These videos. Hey, always a pleasure work with you. And uh, that's everything for this video. If you have any questions what I should ask Eric, leave them in comments. If you like this video, don't forget to press the like button. If you would like to see more videos like this, you know exactly what to do. Subscribe, it helps a lot. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.